Okay, well, it is obviously a pleasure to speak to you today. It's been uh, quite a full weekend for some of us. As you've already heard, we had the privilege of going to a leadership conference and we had a rich diet of input. Uh, there was some seriously good input that we got. And uh, I feel almost a little uh, apprehensive, a little bit almost intimidated to think, well, how can I follow it up for some of you guys that tasted what we tasted yesterday? It was absolutely fantastic. It really was. But I'm really excited about what I'm going to share today. Um, I have uh, just a belief that God is speaking. In fact, it was confirmed to me that God was speaking, in, even while the worship was happening. Some of the things that were shared, uh, and it will, it will begin to click as I begin to talk, um, what Charlotte shared, um, and some of, some of what we, we, we worshipped about, worshipped about today will really hopefully click when I begin to talk about what I'm going to share. Uh, my heart is really to download something from God's heart to you about where we are, you as a person, what God wants to say to you right now in this season at this time. Uh, and I really, I really pray that you're encouraged. Now, I want to talk today about belonging to God. A really clear, simple idea, belonging to God. And God really began to, it was just some weeks ago, I began thinking about this whole idea of belonging to God and, and ownership. And it was inspired by this thought and this scripture. I'm going to ask you to turn to it in a minute. John 14. John, John chapter 14, if you turn to it with me, I'm going to read a few verses there. And this whole idea of belonging to God, for me, is crucial for we who believe. And if you don't believe here today, I believe it is, it's crucial that you hear this message as well. Uh, because we are passionate, we are walking this walk of belonging to God. And we want to really, I believe that you can be inspired by this, about what this can mean for you. And, and those of us who believe that we, are, we can press into this more. So John 14, John 14 Verses 15, I'm going to read from verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the word cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And then the key words here, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now, in other versions, it may say slightly different wordings. In fact, if you look in the New American Standard, for instance, the NIV, the, the, um, uh, the New King James Version, will all say as orphans. But in the New Living Translation, it says this, No, I will not abandon you as orphans. In the King James, it says, I will not leave you, and this is interesting, I will not leave you comfortless. Now, this is going to hopefully begin to make more sense as I unfold a little bit more. Um, I've got 10 pages of material to go through here, so just bear with me. I'm, I'm going to move as quickly as I can. Uh, so, I will not leave you comfortless, it says. I find that really interesting. And the Good News Bible says, when I go, these are the same words here, so I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. The words that are said in the Good News Bible instead of that are, when I go, you will not be left all alone. I find that really interesting as well. So therefore, what we're being told here is that we are no longer orphans. Now, that may seem very strange because uh, maybe many of us here, we have our parents. One or, or both of our parents uh, are still here, still living. Maybe that's not the case for all of us. We may understand this in a literal sense. But actually, the Bible here is saying something very key. The revelation here is about we are no longer orphans. And think about this whole idea of comfortless and being left all alone. These are key things. So what is an orphan? Well, dictionary definition tells us here, it says that a child deprived by death of one or usually both parents. Um, he became an orphan when his parents died in a car accident. Um, we have another uh, meaning here. It says a young animal, it's related obviously, a young animal that has lost its mother feeding... Um, so it lost its mother, um, and they are orphans as well. So a young animal that's lost its mother is also seen as an orphan. And what's interesting here is another one. It says, the first line of a paragraph set as the last line of a page or column considered undesirable. For those of you who are scholars in the uh, English language, an orphan is a, a, an undesirable um, line at the end of a... That was something, I must admit, was new to me. I'm glad I looked it up. In the original languages of the Bible, in the Hebrew and the Greek, it says this. Uh, it says the, the Hebrew word for orphan is, is uh, yatom, which translates as, and this is, I think, quite key, translates as fatherless. So in the Hebrew, it talks about the idea is, is actually very much attached to fatherhood. 
And it says that it talks about being fatherless. And in the Greek word for orphan is orphanos, which translates as desolate, bereaved, and also fatherless. So we have meanings unfolded here in the idea of being an orphan, which are very much connected to this idea of fatherlessness. And we know that I'm of a generation uh, very much where this has become very prevalent. Previous generations to my generation, it was less the case that, that people would maybe were living without fathers, uh, either literally or, or in a figurative sense. This was less the case, but it's more the case now. Mine was probably one of the first generations where it's become very prevalent and very normal for fathers not to be present. Orphans, just as a, a side comment, orphans in the UNICEF and um, global partners definition is this. It defines an orphan as a child under 18 years of age who has lost one or both of their parents um, because of death. And this, this idea of loss, it's quite a, a heavy thing, isn't it? Bible says that we are, says that we are no longer orphans, but actually the whole idea of being an orphan means that there is loss. Uh, you are without somebody, somebody very important in your life, very significant. It's a tragic thing, the loss of a parent. But actually, in the scheme of things, in the scheme of lifetime and generations, it actually is the, it actually is the natural course of things, generationally, for, for, for parents to, to go before children. The other way around is, is, is even, in many ways, more tragic. But despite that, it's still loss. It's still a loss of something. There's still um, something missing there. Generationally, a generation has been lost. In my family, for instance, um, not that generation of, of, of my aunts and my uncles, many of them now have passed. But there was a time when I was younger where most of them were alive. Um, and I remember, I can remember their names and I've talked to my mum about them and remember their names, yes, yes. And, but the generation above that, actually, I can also remember when a significant amount of them were still alive. And most recently, my great aunt uh, passed on at the age of, I believe she was 108, I believe, 110, sorry, correction, 110. And she was effectively the last of that generation to pass. But I was, I was, I'm old enough to remember when all of them were alive. So this idea of loss is very significant. And to think about this, the loss of both parents often defines you as being an orphan. Now, one of the things that, that Becky told me recently is that one of the experiences that she had, she remembers it very clearly, is when her own mum, who's now in her 70s, but at the time was in her 60s, made this comment because she lost both of her parents, and obviously Becky lost her grandparents, in the space of one month. In the space of one month, she lost both her parents. Um, and obviously that was a, a, a huge wrench. And, and the parents, and I remember Becky and I have talked about it a lot, they were very close, and, and I think one death was very much connected to the other, I think, you know, is, is, is the conclusion of it. But the comment that, my, my, um, that Becky's mum made to her was that, I'm an orphan. So this is a woman in her 60s at the time saying, I'm now an orphan. And, and, and that to her was, was one of the most significant things about that, and yet she was a woman in her 60s and, and was, had children and grandchildren at this point. So the loss of a parent lo represents something huge in our lives, doesn't it? But why is that? What is it that re parents represent for us? I'm now a parent. What is it that parents represent? Parents represent your name. My children have the names they have because I named them. Becky and I named them. So they have their name, their identity, because we named them. Uh, they have confidence. And a lot of their confidence comes from us right now at the age where they are. Their confidence is coming from us. They are confident when they are with us. And to have confidence when they're not with us, we are looking for them to have that. We're looking for them to develop that. But actually, a lot of their confidence is coming when they're with us, especially at the age where they are. And as time goes on, time goes on we want them to have confidence more as they're, as they're without us. And that's where independence comes in. But parents represent your name, your authority, your confidence, your identity. Your children's names, how they, how they present themselves, is very much predicated on us as parents. If you're not a parent that... Um, just understand this idea of parenthood as a, as a child. If you are a child here, if all of us are children, you will know that this idea is very significant in terms of your identity and what parents represent for you. That's what they represent. At this age, and my parents represent a support for me differently from how they would do when I was 15, let's say, and still living at home. For instance, in the, in the Irish culture, and it's one of the ones that I'm a little bit familiar with, this whole idea of the name and being attached to the name, there is the, uh, it's in the name. So O'Connell, O'Sullivan, etc., O'Connor, etc. It means son of. The O means son of. Junior, 
Uh, if you didn't know, one of my names, if, if you, I don't really use it, is Junior, because my dad's name is Charles, and so I am Charles Junior. John, John is also, and I uh, uh, won't mind me saying this, he's referred to within his family as Junior, often by his relatives. Because, but his name is actually John, but his father's name is also John, and so he is John Junior. So his identity comes, stems from his father. My identity stems from my father. There is that connection. So this is what parents do for their children. They represent these things. So the loss of that is very significant. And it can mean the loss of, of identity. It can mean the loss of even authority. You see, my mum says, or my dad says, often child, children at a certain age will say this. I say, my mum said to me, or used to say to me, and so I feel a certain confidence in certain things I say, because my mum said it to me. It was passed down to me. My children at age where daddy said and mummy said. So there is an authority that comes with parenthood. The Bible talks about people being referred to as the son of. In many ways, it was when you, were, when you, you have a name, if you read it in the Bible, if you know your Bible uh, a reasonable amount, you will see that when somebody's name is there, often in the Old Testament especially, it would say so and so, son of. And their identity was based on who they were the son of. For those of you uh, uh, who, who like um, uh, comic books, etc., the Avengers, Thor is son of Odin. See, I know, I, know, I know my people, I can hear them, I can hear them, son of Odin. So Odin was the big man, the big man on campus, and Thor only got his authority and his power, if you notice, from his father. Let's think about God as our father. Again, we're talking about belonging to God. So let's think about God as our Father. See, God's heart is for us to understand our position with him as his. As his. As his prized possession. We belong to God. So for those of us who have faith, who believe in God, who have a relationship with him, we know we belong to God. We were singing about that today, weren't we? And this is why so much I know that God is really speaking. and was speaking before I even got up to speak. My children belong to me. In, in their birth certificates, my name is there. Our names are there. We have to sign on a dotted line to say that they are ours. I am legally responsible for my children. Whew. Wow, that's worrying, isn't it? <laughs> but there is a responsibility there. There is a, a, a weight of, of, of burden and responsibility, a privilege as well. They are my children. They are our children. At different points, depending on the conversation, you know, all share this, 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 uh, this reality. You could even hear it as I was saying it, couldn't you? There are points when it's nice, it's my child, that's good, because they did this. But then it's, no, it's your child because they did that. <laughs> Often these things are banded back and forth, aren't they? You know exactly what I mean. We belong. So to God, we are his children, we belong to God. Isaiah 49 describes it in this way, gives us this picture. The prophet Isaiah says this, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you, he says this. It says, See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. This connection between us and God, God the Father, your, your, your names are engraved, it says. Your names are engraved on his hand. That's how, 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 how important, how unforgettable, how important you are. Names are engraved. It says, how can a mother forget the baby at the breast? How can you forget? But even if you do, I will not forget. We are hidden in Christ. Colossians 3 verse 3 tells us this, that you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So you belong to God. Your life is hidden in Christ in God. And... This idea of being hidden, my, my children do this right now because of the age where they are especially. My daughter more than my son, my son kind of, if you know my son, you'll know he's quite rough and tumble and so he doesn't really like to do like, you know, kind of cuddles and mummy's for cuddles, daddy's for, for hitting and beating up. <laughs> but my daughter will do this sometimes and she was doing this to some people yesterday. She just woken up and picked her up and she's holding me and she hides her face in my chest. She will hide her face in my chest and people come and talk to her and, and she'll just hide away and be all cute and, you know, oh, and sometimes maybe if she's a little more bad tempered, she'll actually bat them away. But she hides herself in me because I am daddy, I am security, I am comfort for her. The word is telling us that God is saying that your life is hidden in me. God is saying you are belong to me and your life is hidden in me. I am surrounding you, I am your, your surrounding, I am your, your atmosphere. At that moment in time when my, 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 my daughter is, is, I am her atmosphere, I am her confidence, I am her reassurance at that moment. God's saying he is that to you. God provides for his children. 
Matthew 7, verses 9 to 11 says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Some of you, are, some of you parents are thinking, oh, yeah, do you know what? Sometimes I wish I could just give them something else. It says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So as Father, as Father God, we belong to him. And it's saying here that even, if, even a, a human, even us, fragile human beings, if our child comes to us, there are so many times I could not tell you where your, my son and children are at the age where they demand things. You know how it is. They demand things. They say, I want this. And you're teaching them to be polite. You're teaching them to be patient and so on. And there are so many times when I just want to say, no, I'm not doing that. But, but actually, it's a legitimate thing they're asking for. Maybe they're asking the wrong way. They're asking for food. Or they're asking for, it's a legitimate thing. And they need that thing right now. It's just right for them to have it. And I'm, I have to pause sometimes and say, okay, right. Or I'm tired. I'm just tired. I just, I haven't got, I just, no, I just can't be, but no, I'll get up and I will do. Because I'm father. Because I'm dad. I'm responsible. And they've asked for, for this particular thing which they need. How much more if I do that, who's imperfect, who gets tired, who gets irritable, who shouts at the kids? No, of course I don't. Sorry, forget that. Cut that from there. I don't shout at the kids. But who does all How much more does God, it's saying here, how much more does God know how to give good gifts? If my son asks for milk, I don't then give him, you know, dirt. Do you know what I mean? Like mixed with water. I don't, I don't do that. How much I might feel like it? No, I don't. I don't do that because I'm responsible. I'm father, so I give him milk. How much more is God going to do that for us? If we belong to him, how much more? And so today, if you're going to believe anything, understand this, that belonging to God means that this is the heart of God, that he provides for his children, that he, your life is hidden in him, that there is security and atmosphere in God. Your atmosphere, your, your security is in God. As a, as a parent, my children have my favour. I may not always you know, like them or want them around me, but they have my favour, okay? They have my favour because they're my children. They have an audience with me. They can come to me and say certain things, or I, can, I will listen to them. I will, I will put up with certain things because they are my children. At this stage of development, much of my favour and our favour as parents is dependent on whether they get the thing that they want when they want it. You know this is true, don't we? That's often, so if they don't get what they want, when they want it, often we, they don't have our favour, as far as they're concerned. What they don't seem to understand, and, and they will, this is something that comes with maturity and age, hopefully, God willing, come on, that our favour is not based on that. We love them regardless. We will do whatever we can for them. We will protect them. We will go to the end of the earth for them, regardless of whether they get a milk 30 seconds from now or not. But for them... It's all about that. It's all about if I get what I want, when I want, yes, then it's all good. If not, I don't like you. I don't like you anymore. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. How many, how many parents have heard that one? How many parents have heard that one? See, our, parent as, our job as parents is to handle the, the needs versus the wants and the demands of our children. To balance those two things. The needs versus the wants. That's our job as parents. And that's a tough job, and it's an ongoing job, and it just goes on and on and on. And... How many of you know, this is quite a clear thing, an obvious thing, but how many of you know your children need to eat? Your children need to eat. However, that does not mean that they can eat anything they want at any time they want and, and at any amount that they want. Doesn't it, don't, don't we know that? We know they need food, but it doesn't mean they can have anything at any time and any, any amount of it. We have to, at a certain age with our children, we have to just to monitor these things and measure, just, just kind of you know, measure it, don't we? We have to just, no, you're not having that. You're not having chocolate at midnight. You should be in bed already, for instance. It, we have to measure that. Now, it is an interesting point. This whole idea of our job as parents right now is very much to make sure, and we're, we're desperately trying to make sure our children aren't spoilt. They're not spoilt, they're not pampered. They get some nice things, you know, maybe they get a bit of bread and water every now and then, you know, just, just to keep them humble and so. We don't want them to be spoilt. We don't want them to be spoilt. That's the job, that's the responsibility. You know what the definition of spoilt is? It says to dis diminish or destroy the value or quality of. That's what the definition of spoilt is. And, the, and, the, and another, another definition here is harm the character of by being too lenient or indulgent. Even as I'm pointing to you, I'm pointing at myself. To diminish or destroy the value or quality of. 
Remember, we're talking about this whole idea of belonging to God and God as Father and, and, and the job that he has and the desire he has to give to us and to, and to, and to be everything for us. And yet, just a question for you, just a little side note. How many, how many of you imagine and think that actually maybe God has this dilemma with us? That maybe he, he's thinking about whether we're going to be spoilt or not? in certain circumstances, that whether maybe it's good for us to wait, good for us maybe not to have a certain thing when we think we should have it. How many of you think maybe God is in the same position? Even though we belong to him, he's our responsibility, or we are his response, you know. How, how, how many of you think maybe he has that same dilemma? Some of you here maybe who have been impatient with God, irritable with God. So why don't I get this, God? Why haven't you done this then? How many think maybe God knows what he's doing, understands? Because at that time, and, and my children are very good at this, and so many of you will know exactly the same experience. At that moment in time when you don't get what you want, it's the end of the world, and everybody's going to know about it. Everybody in the, in the shop who can hear about it is going to hear about it. Everybody, wherever you are, is going to hear about how hard, how hard done by you are. Just a bit of food for thought for you there. Just a bit of food for thought. Moving on. Let's think about the power of our belonging to God, the power of our belonging to God, and us being his children. Romans 8, I'm going to read Romans 8 here, verses 14 to 17. Romans 8 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit who received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If we, are, um, sorry, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. We are, it says, the spirit we have received does not make you slaves. There is freedom. It says to fear again, that we live in fear again, rather that you have received the spirit brought to you about, and it brings adoption as sonship, to sonship. It says by a spirit that is in you, cries Abba, Father. So it's, there, is a, there is an imperative, an instinct in us, in the spirit, that says we can relate to God as Father, that belongs to him. He, he has deposited that spirit in us to say, that says Abba, Father. Can't help but respond to God in that way. Let's think about this connection. Think about the connection of the spirit, the Holy Spirit, in this, in this belonging to God. It's so central. John 14 tells us this. I'm going to read chapter, John, John, so I'm going to read chapter 14, verse 16. It says, And I will ask, and 17, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will leave you a comforter, it says. Or I said, I will give you another advocate. In other versions of this particular verse, it says, helper or counsellor. Advocate. In other versions, it says, advocate, helper or counsellor. In the King James, it says this, I will give you another comforter. Another comforter. Remember the, 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 the relationship between the Holy Spirit in our relationship with God when Jesus was talking, this is Jesus here talking to disciples, says, I, when I'm gone, I'm going to leave you. I will ask the Father to, to, to provide for you another comforter or counselor or advocate. I'm going to leave that with you. The Holy Spirit was that comforter. If you belong to God and God is your Father, then parents provide comfort, don't they? That's what they should do. That's what parents should do. It's part of their job is to provide comfort. See, it's a rare thing that I get to do this, but I do sometimes get to do this to my son in particular because he's just not like that. He kind of with me. And sometimes he'll come to me for comfort. He'll come to me for a hug and he'll just want that reassurance. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, it's good. I like it. It's good. Because I don't want it too often. I don't want him to come to me too often. You know? but, but often enough, he's good. And so he comes to me and he comes to me for comfort. God said and inspired word here to us. Jesus was talking to his disciples and said, I will leave you a comforter. A comforter, the Holy Spirit. This is key here when we're talking about our relationship with God and belonging to God and what that can mean for what God does for us. You see, parents should equal comfort. Part of our job is comfort. It's not all of it, but part of it is that. So that comforter 
God is saying is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So in other words, the Holy Spirit can parent us. The Holy Spirit can provide comfort, direction, discipline, release, correction. The Holy Spirit can do that because God, Jesus said he had sent a comforter or advocate or helper. I'm going to leave that with you. So when the disciples were without Jesus, they were left with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was there to provide those things, that direction, that comfort, that, that sense of where to go. For some of you, may, this may blow your minds. For some of you, I, I hope you're being inspired for this, for, that, that you understand this, this relationship of the Holy Spirit in how we are relating to, to God and belong to God. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verses 22 to 27 says this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption, for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently. Key verse, verse 26 of Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We, are not, we, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So the Spirit himself helps us. I will send you a comforter, a helper, an advocate. We see him where we're going here, that in belonging to God, he says, I will send you a comforter. I will send you a, a helper, a, a, an advocate. And he says that the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. So in our inadequacies, in our weaknesses, in our limitations as, as, as mere human beings, but belonging to God, there is a key impact that the Holy Spirit has in this. He says, we know that all things, verse 28 says, we know that all, God works all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. As parents, I want to do everything I can for my children. I want to work everything out for their good. But they are not always necessarily going to be aware of that at certain stages. God wants to work out everything for your good. And he has a way of doing that. He has, a, he has a, 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 an advocate, a helper that he can bring to you that he says is available to you. Something for us just to be aware of. I want to just, just, just continue on in this thought about the Spirit just as we, as, as, we, as we kind of land here soon. Jesus, talking to his disciples, says this in John 16. This is something for us to be aware of when we think about this whole idea of, of our relationship with God and belonging to God and that actually God wants to provide for us. He's provided a comforter for us. I want us to be aware of something. It says in, verse six, sorry, in, in John 16, verse 7, it says, But truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Because remember when Jesus was talking about bringing a comforter, he was, he was saying to the, the disciples, I'm going, but I'm going to leave somebody with you who will do these things for you. So in John 16, he's saying, truly I tell you, it's not good, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate or helper or comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus had to go in order for the Holy Spirit to come and to do what he was going to do. The disciples at that moment in time were probably freaking out because they'd spent three years with him, living and sleeping, day in, day out with him. Just there. God was just, Jesus was just there. God was just there. At that moment's notice, they could just knock on the door or just go into the other room and say, Jesus, can I talk to you? He was that available to them. But God says, Jesus said, I'm going now, but I'm going to leave somebody with you. For some of us, the Holy Spirit doesn't get a look in. I'm going to be very frank here, and I say this to myself. There are times when the Holy Spirit doesn't get a look in in your life because actually you're too busy depending on a thing or a person or a circumstance to do what the Holy Spirit can do for you. Because God said, I leave you a comforter. I will leave you a comforter, a helper, an advocate. And the Holy Spirit is there to do that. But for some of us, we, he doesn't get a look in. Because we're too, too busy looking at the other thing. That's what's going to do that. That person's going to do that for me. That thing's going to do that for me. No, God says, the Holy Spirit, my spirit is there to do that for you. So here's, here's the major blockage that we can have to God. We need to be aware of this, that certain crutches we need to be, need to be removed from our lives. Certain things that we've relied on need to be removed from our, our lives. 
as Jesus was at that point, he was crucial for their, 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 their season of life. At that time, he was crucial, but he had to go in order the Holy Spirit could come and do its job and release them. So some things for us need to be removed. Some crutches, some rely, rely, reliances that we've had need to be removed. I challenge myself with that as well. I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes on this key thing that God was just, just, just had, had on my heart that I really want to share with you and leave with you. And think about this whole idea of belonging to God. As being an orphan, an orphan there is a sense of loss and not belonging because the people that you should belong to aren't there. And so you can feel lost. That's one of the things. And I, I did a little bit of research on the whole idea of, of an orphan just in terms of, just, and there was more that I could have read. But one of the things that God was really sharing with me as I was talking, thinking about this was this idea of a spirit that we can carry that blocks us from having God as our father and God to help guide us, that blocks us from allowing him to do that, that blocks us from allowing the Holy Spirit to be the comforter and the guider and the helper and the, the counselor, is this, is a spirit of the orphan, the orphan spirit, an orphan spirit that we can carry with us. See, this orphan spirit kind of manifests itself in this way. And this is how you know, God was, was, was showing it to me, that an orphan spirit will seek out belonging. It will seek out belonging, wants to belong, wants to be attached to things, but doesn't want responsibility, doesn't want to maybe input into something, but just wants to belong. As, as parents, my, our job and as parents, yours is to help our children to belong somewhere. And their, their, their first place of belonging is in the family, isn't it? That's where they belong, in the family. The, 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 the orphan spirit also has a lack of identity or, or a distorted identity because the identity that should come should come from parents, but the parents aren't there, and so there is a distorted identity or a lack of identity. There is emotional isolation with this spirit of this orphan spirit and mistrust. Am I, am I maybe pressing some buttons here? Maybe it's a bit uncomfortable. I, I have to speak to myself even as I'm saying this about this orphan spirit. You see, parents help us to trust, learn how to trust, who to trust, in what situations to trust. Parents help us to do this. But when there isn't the parents, how do we do that? So if today maybe you're identifying some things here about this idea of the orphan spirit, the spirit that, that kind of just creates a blockage to God being able to do what he wants to do for us. See, ultimately what we can do if we have an orphan spirit is to reject the father heart of God. We reject it. You don't mean to. You think, well, well, I've never rejected God. But maybe you can do that in so many different ways because you will feel without help, without support. You feel lost. You feel a victim. But as God is saying, you're no longer an orphan. You're no longer lost. You're no longer, you're no longer without support, without help. You're no longer that. He says, I will not leave you as orphans, comfortless, bereaved, helpless. I will come back to you. Psalm 68 tells us that he is a father to the fatherless. So sing to God, sing in praise of his name, extol him who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is the God in his holy dwelling. And here's one of my favorite scriptures that I, 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 I share with you, I've shared with our young people and something that I've carried for many years about this truth about God is this, in verse 6 of Psalm 68, God sets the lonely in families. But he leads out the and he leads out the prisons with singing. God sets the lonely in family. If you're here today and you, you feel lonely, know that you're in a family. You're in God's family. And if you've never been in, 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 in God's family, you can be in God's family. You're here today for the first time. You can be in God's family. We welcome you because God welcomes you because the Father heart of God says, you can be mine. My time has run out. I, I, I really want us just to... To, to, to respond to this and take a moment to respond to this because I think this, this idea of, of who God is in our life and us belonging to God is key. It's key for what we will face in the future. It's key for how we will break through, how we will overcome. It's key that we identify in this way. There are things that maybe you have not overcome because you have not overcome this idea and you have not identified as belonging to God. And so you cannot overcome, you cannot break through because you carry maybe this orphan spirit. That, that believes and walks as if you are without parents, that you are lost, that you are bereaved, that you are comfortless, that you are helpless, and you walk and you live in this reality. But God is saying, no, I will come to you. <laughs> I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I have not left you as orphans. You, are now, you now have a father, which is me. 
And he is the ultimate father. The ultimate father. He has no faults, no errors, no limits, no, no things that he, he, he well, I, I didn't have the patience for that. I have plenty of things I don't have the patience for, but God is not like that. We belong to God. So in a moment, if the band could just come up and help me a moment, I just want us to, I want us just to pray for a moment. I want to give you an opportunity to just acknowledge God in your, in your place right now, that maybe you can, you can break through to a new place in God, a new identity in God, a new freedom in God, that you're not bound by the sense of, of helplessness, of, of being without support, knowing that you have support, you have comfort, I will leave you a comforter. So I'm going to just ask the band to play. I want us just to take a moment just to spell your heads. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to speak some things out. I want us maybe just to just to respond to God now because we can take these things and walk in that and it can be stay in our heads and never deposit down into our hearts and so we don't walk with it. It's just a concept. It's just an idea. But this actually is, is more than that. God wants to deposit something in your hearts that you carry that brings new strength, new boldness, new increase to who you are, that you can step into things you never imagined you could step into because you understand that you belong to God. You know where you belong, you know who you are, you know what you stand for, who you stand for. It's God. Just as we're praying now and as you just meditating on God and just thinking how that deposits with you, this idea of belonging to God, what that means for you today in this season. He is a father to the fatherless. He will not leave you <laughs> as orphans. You know, if that's you today, and we're, I want you just to now, we're going to, my, 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 my heart is for you to respond to the comforter, to the Holy Spirit, the comforter right now. So me is the comforter. I'm just seeking to just be a, a conduit, a answer the call to say, will you respond? Will you respond to my comforter, he says. God says, will you respond to my comforter? I, have, I will leave you a comforter. I've left you a, a comforter, an advocate. If today your heart responds to that, there's something about that, that that resonates with you, that belonging to God has, 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 has been an issue. You've, not, you've never known it, actually. This is maybe new to you. But if it isn't new to you, you've just struggled with it. You know that you need to make a breakthrough in this. I'm going to ask you to do something very, very brave today. I'm just going to ask you to stand. And we're going to just pray and we're going to believe for God to deposit more of His Holy Spirit in you. But I'm just going to ask you to stand. I'm going to give you a moment. And I'm going to ask you to stand and just respond to God. God wants to minister to you. God wants to, to work in you. I'm not going to be here for long. So I want you to take this moment now to respond to God. If you know that you, you have lacked that sense of help, that sense of support, a sense of belonging, for whatever reason, we don't need to know, God knows. I want, just to, I want you just to stand now. Respond to God. Lord, we just a call for your Holy Spirit, God because you are the comforter. Just in this moment, just in these few minutes that we have. I 
pray, God, that for those who feel that loss, who feel that, that sense of helplessness, that, Lord, you would send your comforter to them right now. Lord, open hearts, bring new expectancy into lives of what you can do. At this moment in time, open your hearts. Open your life right now to the comforter, to the advocate, to the counsellor. I'm just going to pray and I want us just to worship and we'll and leave it there. Lord, we thank you that you are, we belong to you. We thank you that you have left a comforter for us, that we are in you, we belong to you, that you can surround us. And I pray that you would deposit that, that confidence, new confidence, God, into lives greater identity, God, greater boldness, greater confidence that comes from you, from nowhere else but from you. Just believe for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, just one final thing as we're, as we've just been worshipping. The Lord was just speaking to me as we were just worshipping then. That for some of you, you need to chase after God. You need to chase after God. My parents, my, my children chase me. They harass me. They nag me at times. And we can joke about that and laugh. But, but the seriousness of that is this. They have a desire because they want something from me. Sometimes it's even just a cuddle. Even just cuggle is what my daughter will say to me. Just wants me to pick her up and to hug her. For some of you, you've, you've spent so long trying to depend on your own resources, your own or other things, and you haven't chased after God. And he's saying, you need to chase after me. I'm right here. Just call on me. Pursue me. I'm right here. I will pick you up. I will carry you. I will comfort you. I will instruct you. I will be all that you need. So whoever that, that really speaks to one or, or many of you, I just want you to receive that from God. God is saying that right now. He wants you to chase after him. He's right here. Amen. Okay. Well, our time is up now. Um, I'm actually just going to take a moment because I've just been made aware um, that Sam is, is outside and has and actually had a seizure. And he's being treated right now. So I just, just want us to pray very quickly before we finish. So it's going to pray and just believe for God to do what he does, which is the miraculous. There's a life that he's been dedicated to him. Sam has dedicated his life to God. Even only weeks ago, he came and, and, and was baptized, wasn't he, to, to witness of how much he is committed to God. So we just want to believe for God just to do the miraculous in his life right now. So let's just pray. God, we, we believe for you, God. We know what has happened. You know what has happened. And Lord, we just press into you and believe, God, for your, your healing, your restoration, that wholeness will come. Lord, may there come out of this a testimony of what it is that you do, of who you can be in the life of a young life that is dedicated to you. Lord, we just reach out to Sam now and just believe, God, that in, in the, the, the paramedics and the treatment he is having, that, Lord, he will, he will just make a full recovery for that he will be stronger after this than he was before god we just believe for that there will be a new strength in him that he will have a new sense of strength and health in his body we believe for that god we believe for that now in jesus name in jesus name send your comfort to god send your comfort to now you have said that you will send your comfort lord you'll send your comfort to now into that situation and do what we cannot do what humans cannot do, what doctors cannot do, but only you can do, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.